Good morning. Does anybody know what today might be if we were to choose a date on the Christian calendar? Anyone have an idea? Palm Sunday. That's correct. It is indeed Palm Sunday. You have all done a great job. You passed the test 100%. But did you know that on Palm Sunday, people celebrated stuff? Yeah. They didn't just see Jesus walking in on a donkey and stand there and just say, hey, look, it's Jesus. No, no, no. They did something quite radical. Well, probably radical to us. They sang very loudly. They danced a lot. They put palm branches on the ground. This was a day of celebration because Jesus Christ, the King of Israel and of us now, came to Jerusalem. So this moment today is a day of excitement. I sometimes get told I use the word excitement too much. But I think that today is a perfect day to use it. So, if you are joining us in person, I'd love for you to stand with us. If you're joining us at home, I know you're standing already. And if you're not, why don't you stand with us as well? Because we are going to sing, we are going to clap together, we are going to celebrate the coming King of Israel. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away.
Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we want to welcome you this morning to Victory Baptist Church, and uh, I think we're, we've come back to reality this week with spring, haven't we? Amen. Yeah. It was, it, it was good while it lasted, that like 20 degree weather, uh, had the shorts out, it was beautiful. Um, well, this, in our series so far in, in the Gospel of John, we've been, we've been looking at chapters 14 through 16, and, and we're looking forward to the, to, to the Easter season. And uh, John's Gospel uh, has sometimes been described as sort of a pendulum swing. It goes from triumph, kind of up high, down to this low moment of, of the crucifixion, and then ends in triumph again. And that, that's sort of how this season goes. This morning is, is one where we, we, we sing Hosanna, where we, we praise the Lord. And um, when, in that story, uh, where Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, we see that uh, he's coming as a king. And the people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means, Lord, save us. They acknowledge that Jesus is a king, but in that acknowledgement, there's something missing, isn't there? Because only a, a, a few days later, a week later, he's crucified. And as I was thinking about that story, I, I recalled uh, there's, a, there's a play by T.S. Eliot called Murder in the Cathedral, and it tells the story of Thomas Beckett, who was a priest and was murdered uh, in his church. And uh, in this play, he faces four temptations to sort of compromise in his stance and in his position. And the last temptation is, is the hardest one, because it sounds right. And uh, he says, the last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason. And I was thinking about that and how these people welcome Jesus in, uh, in the gospel. They're doing the right thing, acknowledging Jesus as a king, but for the wrong reason. They want Jesus to be a king in the way that they expected him to be. But Jesus has a different plan, doesn't he? And I wanted to think about that in our own lives because I think uh, we, we, in Isaiah he says this, that these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see, we can sometimes approach re worship, worshiping Jesus, our relationship with Jesus, and do things for the right reason, but, but, but have the wrong motives. We can have the wrong motives. Our heart might not be in the right place. We can be doing the right thing, but it's just not, it's, 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 a, it's a bad motive. And so Easter asks us to, to examine our hearts and say, uh, and, and, and look to God's word and examine those places and come before him in confession and say, Lord, I want my heart to be right with you. Uh, so even though we can sing Hosanna and we can be joyous, we can be joyous because we know that our sins have been forgiven, but it's this ongoing thing that we must continually examine our hearts and confess our sins before the Lord. And I hope that's something we can do as we ponder the crucifixion over this Easter season. So let's continue to worship together and ask the Lord just to, to open your hearts and, and expose those things in your life. One day when heaven was filled with his praises One day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelt among men, my example is he Word became flesh and the light shined among us. His glory revealed. Would you join us? Living He loved me. Dying He saved me. Buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified.
up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, it reads this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you will also appear with him in glory. Jesus is alive. He is not dead. And because he is alive, we too experience newness of life. Our life is hidden in Christ. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. God sent his son, 
They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know Cross that river, I fight life's fine, no war with pain, and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know He reigns. Yes, He reigns. tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives Hallelujah, he lives. You may be seated. How good it is to know that God holds the future, especially in these times, and to know that God is in control. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Um, just such a powerful, a beautiful thing to know that God is in control. One of the things that uh, we like to do as a church is to each month just highlight some of the missionaries that we have the privilege of uh, supporting uh, as a church and just to lift them up in prayer and to give you an update on the work that they're doing. And um, especially these times, it's, it's, it's amazing to see how they continue uh, to serve uh, despite uh, COVID-19 uh, and all the kind of adaptations that a lot of missionaries have had to make. So we're just going to have these slides come up uh, with some of the, the missionaries. Um, and so the first is uh, Jose and April uh, Melgar, and they are serving in Bolivia. And uh, the Melgars are overseeing the establishment of an orphanage, and also they're involved in uh, a church planting in the region. And, um, and part of this, this orphanage, they, they work with kids, and it, they, they've done a, a kind of a discipleship program that they're responsible uh, for. Now, if you go to the next slide, we can just see some of the ways that we can pray and continue to pray for them. Um, after this past year has been kind of a frustrating year for them, uh, kind of waiting on the government uh, to give them uh, permission to start accepting uh, orphans. And so what they finally were able to do is they gave them sort of eight children as, on a trial basis just to see how they took care of these kids uh, for a couple weeks. And, um, and so they, they, they did that, and um, they said it, w it went really well. Um, but uh, just pray for the, the, the sort of next steps of that process so they can have kids uh, at the orphanage full time. And I know that they said in their letter that the, the, the kids were crying when they had to go back uh, to the state orphanage because the difference between uh, the state orphanage 
and uh, the, the treatment or the, the care that they receive at, the, at this orphanage is so much more, uh, so much better. Uh, but just praise God, too, that during this time, they, they offered kind of a, a kid's camp um, and a good news club, and that all eight children uh, asked to receive Christ as their Savior during that time. And um, so just, but just be in prayer for these children. Um, many of them come from abusive homes, and so they were able to see some of the, the, the impact that that had on some of the kids, uh, anger issues and, and stuff like that, and, um, and just kind of dealing with the neglect that they faced in uh, these state orphanages. I know she mentioned that um, they sort of are left on their own, except when they misbehave, and then they actually put them in a, in a sort of a locked room uh, by themselves as their punishment. And so just the, this on a young kid, uh, we can just pray for them and, and just the, the work that they're going to have to do uh, with these children when they finally do receive them. Uh, the next uh, ministry is uh, TLC Life Center, and this is closer to home, uh, just in Newmarket here. And they are an education facility helping women uh, facing uh, unplanned pregnancy. And they also offer other services as well, uh, counseling and, um, and support, uh, how, to, how to deal with finances, all kinds of stuff uh, that they deal with with, uh, with young women. And so if we go to the next slide, we can see how we can pray. Um, one of the ways we can pray, and I'm sure this is true in a lot of different areas, is just the uh, increased uh, rate of depression that they're encountering uh, with young mothers and uh, just how COVID has completely changed their world. And um, one of the things they're also finding is during lockdown, they've received a lot more uh, calls uh, about people considering abortion. Uh, and so pray as more women are being forced with this decision whether to choose uh, life and just pray for them as they counsel uh, these women. And uh, there is in one particular, they just asked to pray for this one mo mother who is expecting but has recently uh, left an abusive relationship and has no financial stability. And so they're just praying that uh, they'll be able to take care of her needs and, um, and all the emotional turmoil that she's facing. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to pray for that in a moment. And, uh, but first, we're just going to bring our offerings uh, before the Lord. And uh, what these offerings go towards is ministries like TLC and, and Jose and April and, and uh, those ministries that really go... Uh, they're all around the world, and, but also the ministry of Victory Baptist Church here, and we just praise God for his continued faithfulness that we're seeing uh, in, in giving. And so let us pray for these missionaries and for our offering uh, at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can, we can come before you and that you hear us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, as we bring these gifts uh, that uh, these gifts go towards uh, the furthering of the gospel, the, of, of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ around the world um, and in our community. And so, Lord, may you take these gifts and may you just bless them. May we see a, a great harvest uh, come uh, from the giving of these gifts, Lord. And we pray in particular for uh, Jose and, and April uh, as they serve in Bolivia. We thank you for the, the work that they have done in constructing this orphanage. And uh, we just praise God for um, just answers to prayer that they've been able to receive these eight children and that these kids uh, came to uh, a saving relationship with you, Lord Jesus. We just thank you for the incredible ministry that they are doing. And we pray uh, for each one of these children who... Um, Will, uh, are, will just face um, such hardship and, and difficulty in their families, and I'm sure will carry those scars uh, for the rest of their lives. But uh, may you just give Jose and April wisdom on how to um, just speak uh, hope and grace and love into those kids' lives and just to demonstrate the love of Christ to them. And may that uh, just make all the difference, Lord, in their life. We pray also for the TLC uh, Life Center, and we thank you for the work that they are doing. And uh, we pray for uh, the mothers that they are encountering who are suffering from depression. And we pray, Lord, even for mothers uh, that, uh, that aren't uh, part of TLC, that uh, we know this has just been a hard year 
uh, for so many mothers carrying uh, an extra burden of, uh, of caring for children in isolation at times and, and um, having to uh, te- help, help with uh, online schooling. Uh, we just pray for uh, your healing touch and for, um, that you would speak hope into their lives. We pray, uh, Lord, for this young mother who is um, uh, just left an abusive situation, and we pray that you would just care for her needs and uh, surround her with supports and the things that she needs, Lord, to take care of this, uh, this child that she, um, that she will be uh, delivering. And Lord, we pray for all those mothers who um, have to make the difficult choice or, or, or just weighing um, th- this consideration of, of whether to abort a child. And Lord, may you just give TLC wisdom in how to speak uh, into their lives and, and say, Lord, that um, there is another way that uh, this child has been um, formed by you and has um, been knit together in their womb and that ha- God has a plan for their lives. And so, Lord, may you just give wisdom to them as they counsel these women. And so, Lord, we, we lift up these prayers and we lift up these offerings to you uh, this morning and knowing that you are faithful and that you are with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so if you, uh, in just a moment, the scripture reading will show up on the screen. If you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 16, we'll be start reading in verse 16. Today's scripture is John 16, verses 16 through 33. Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then, after a little while, you will see me. At this time, some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while, you will see me no more. And then, after a little while, you will see me. Because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, What does this mean by this little, mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Verily, truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I see but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I have, at, I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered into the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone 
ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe? Jesus replied, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me alone, yet I am not alone for my Father is with me. <clears throat> I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the word of the Lord. On the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus told his disciples, you will have trouble in this world. I'm sure this is something we know all too well. We will have trouble in this world. Whoever said the Bible wasn't relevant. In this world, we will experience pain. We will experience sadness. We will walk the road of suffering and sorrow. There will be distress. We will mourn and we will grieve. There will be tears. We will weep and we will cry. In this world, we will have trouble. And Jesus told his disciples this to prepare them so they would not be surprised when the trouble came upon them. He did not tell them this to crush them in their spirit, but instead to, to build them up so that they would have the courage to, to carry on. And his message to them was this, you will face trouble in this world, but take heart, the trouble does not win. There will be joy. He told them, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. And here's something that I want us as Christians to understand, and I think it's easy for us to be hard on ourselves. We, we sometimes get this picture in our mind that we as Christians just should be happy all the time. And if we're not, we start to think that there's something wrong with us, as if our faith is not strong enough. As, and and we, we can't just get through this sadness. But the reality is that we will grieve in this life. We will hurt, and we will suffer. There is a great many sadnesses that we will experience. In this world, we will know the pain that comes when we lose someone who we love, even if we know that they are in heaven. We will ache for them. We will miss them terribly. We'll feel that emptiness. We will feel the pain of others who suffer. You know, I know a young boy right now who has cancer, and my heart breaks for him and his family. I know a fella, I, I met him recently, who's the same age as me, and, and he has nothing. And he is so lonely. My heart breaks for him. We will hurt over things we wish we had done. We will mourn over the opportunities that we wasted. We will feel the pain of broken relationships, broken marriages, broken parents. We will grieve in this life. But, Jesus said to his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Your grief will turn to joy. And you might wonder, how, how could your grief ever turn to joy? It may sound too good to be true. You may be so defeated you can't imagine living without the hurt. You might not even have the courage to, to risk the thought of having joy in case it, you couldn't have it. You wouldn't want to be let down again. Sometimes we have just been hurt so often we would never dare risking uh, getting hurt like that again. But Jesus' word to us is this. Take heart have courage, I will turn your grief to joy, and your joy is secure in me. And this is what I want us to know. When Jesus is the source of our joy, no one can take, or sorry, our joy cannot be taken from us. When Jesus is the source of our joy, our joy cannot be taken from us. You will grieve. However, 
with Jesus. Grief is temporary and joy is permanent. You see, grief with Jesus, it's like a hard winter. When you're in the midst of it, sometimes you think, will this ever end? But we know without fail, the sun always comes and melts it all away. We see it season after season. Jesus will bring us through the hard winter and he will melt it all away. Our joy is permanent with Jesus. It endures. It never ends. It is secure. It is everlasting. On the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus said this to his disciples. No one, no one will take away your joy. Try this. Try this for a moment. I want you to try to name someone who can take away your joy in Jesus. Try it. If you're struggling doing it, it's because it's not possible. No one can take away your joy that is in Jesus Christ. When Jesus is the source of our joy, our joy cannot be taken from us. He, he is this spring of water that never runs dry. In John 4, 14, Jesus said, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. When we abide in Jesus and Jesus in us, Jesus fills us with his joy and it cannot be taken away. Now the joy that we have in Christ, it should not be confused with just mere feelings of happiness because feelings are fleeting. They depend on circumstances in that moment. But the joy we have in Christ is different. It's not temporary, but it's permanent. It's not founded on circumstances, but it's founded on the certainty of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. And you might be hurting, you might be grieving, but know this, when you abide in Jesus, Jesus is in you. Jesus in you. The grief, the hurt, the heartache, it does not last. Jesus turns our grief to joy. And I want us to look at the context in which Jesus spoke these words to his disciples. Because Jesus told his disciples that they would have permanent joy in him. And I want each of us to know why our joy in Christ is permanent. So if you're not already there, please turn with me in your Bibles to John 16. John 16. I always encourage you, have your Bibles open. It's so good for us to be in the Word of God together. Yeah, being in the Word is comfort to the soul. Now let's just stop for a moment here and just ask God to speak to our troubled hearts. God in heaven, you are our faithful creator. You are where we long to be. Come to us, Lord Jesus, and abide in us so that your joy may be in us and our joy may be complete. Open our heart and mind to your words so that we may understand. And in understanding, have faith, and in faith, grow in our love for you. Lord, we ask that you comfort us in our grief. You would comfort us in our trouble, for you are the God of all comfort. By your Spirit, teach us to rely on you fully. Lord, we ask that you forgive us of our unbelief, for we have, we have been wrong. We have been blinded by our sin. Forgive us of our pride. For we are low, but you are on high. And we come hurting and bowed down. And we ask that you raise us up so that we may rejoice in you. You are our great God in heaven, who is mighty indeed, and is the source of our joy. Your love never fails, and it is far-reaching. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and we trust that we will receive them from your gracious hand. Amen. Why? Is joy in Christ permanent? Let's, let's start by looking at what Jesus said to his disciples. Now, I don't know if you're a fan of riddles or not, but what Jesus said to his disciples in verse 16 is a bit of a riddle. It definitely stumped them. Look at what he said. In a little while you will see me no more, but then after a little while you will see me. And you have to remember this, this took place prior to Jesus' crucifixion. The disciples were trying to make sense uh, without knowing of what he said, without knowing the full story. And this riddle, it stumped them. I want you to look at the reaction. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, you see, they kept it to them, their confusion to themselves. They didn't want Jesus to know they didn't get it. And they questioned, well, 
what does he mean by, by saying, in a little while you'll see me no more, and then after a little while you'll see me, and because I am going to the Father. They are asking, what, what does Jesus mean by this riddle? And they linked it to something that Jesus had said previously, we see it in verse 10, that he was going to his Father, and they're trying to piece this all together. And what they couldn't figure out was, what did he mean by a little while? It says they kept asking, what does he mean? By a little while, we don't understand what he's saying. So what is significance, or what is significant about this departure that Jesus is talking about that would happen in a little while? And what is significant about uh, his, his return? We, they knew he was going somewhere. They said, he said, you, you won't see me anymore. But, but he would return, because he said, then in a little while you'll see me. What was this departure and return, and why was it so central to Jesus? And just as a good teacher knows, when their student has a question, it says Jesus saw they wanted to ask him about this. They, Jesus saw all the head scratching going on amongst them, and he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said in a little while you'll see me no more than after a little while you'll see me? And, and they most definitely were, as I'm sure we would have. May even ask it now, what's going on? So Jesus adds more detail to this riddle. In verse 20 he says, very truly I tell you, or, or, or truly, truly, and Jesus started out by saying this, not because he would sometimes fib or lie to them, but he said it to signify that what he was about to tell them was an important truth. So he tells them, very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. So let's kind of stop here and ask, we've got to ask a few questions. We're going to ask, what is the departure in a little while that Jesus is referring to? What is the return in a little while that he is referring to? Why are the disciples going to weep and mourn while the world rejoices? And what will cause the disciples' grief to turn to joy? So what we know is that Jesus was preparing his disciples for his death. And the reason he said, in a little while you will see me no more, is because he would soon be crucified. It would, be, it would actually be the next day. He would die, and they would see him no more. And we all understand the pain that comes with being separated from someone we love. And the reason the disciples would weep and mourn is because they love Jesus, and he would die and be buried. And in contrast, it's interesting, in contrast to their grief, Jesus said the world would rejoice at his death. Now the word world, it represents in this context the corrupt value system that stands in opposition to God. We're told in Acts 2 that Jesus was put to death by wicked men. In Matthew's Gospel, we are told that many hurled insults at Jesus while he hung on the cross, while others mocked him. In John 14, uh, 30, Jesus referred to Satan as the prince of this world. You see, it was those uh, who followed this corrupt value system of the world that rejoiced when Jesus died. And this is not unlike our world today. Many to this day still mock Jesus while others worship him. Now the amazing part of this riddle is found in the second half of it. You see, the first half is grief. It's all grief. You will see me no more. But the second half of it, it it's joy. It is pure joy. The reason Jesus said to his disciples, then after a little while or after I die, you will see me, is because Jesus would be raised from the dead. Why is our... Our joy in Christ permanent? Our joy is permanent because Jesus lives. Our joy is permanent because Jesus lives. Our joy is that Christ is not dead, he is alive. The grave is empty. 
He is risen from the dead. The resurrection takes all our grief and turns it to joy. And I want you to, I want you to look at John 20, 20. John 20, 20. Just flip a few pages forward. You see, I kind of want to show you the full circle. In chapter 16, Jesus told his disciples, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. He told them, you will see me again. Do you ever think, do you ever think about what, it, what it's going to be like when we get to see Jesus? Like, I, I can't wait. See, we, we may grieve now in this world, but a day is coming when our grief will turn to joy. And I, I want you to see the disciples' reactions to when they saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. It says in John 20, 20, when Jesus came to them, he showed them his hands and his side. Marks from the crucifixion. And then here it is. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Their grief had turned to joy. They no longer wept, but rejoiced. You see, our joy is that Christ is not dead. He is alive. Jesus then related the disciples' experience to childbirth. If you go back to chapter 16, verse 21, he gave the disciples this illustration. He said, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into this world. Now, some, some mothers may be sitting here thinking, this must have been written by a man because I still remember the pain. Okay? And I dare not argue that. Wouldn't dare. But the point is this. In childbirth, there is pain, but there is joy. And the joy far outweighs the pain. A new mother looks at her child, she forgets the pain, for the pain is over and her joy is full. Jesus' point is much like Paul's in Romans 8.18, uh, where he said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The point is that being with Jesus for all eternity far outweighs any of our suffering, all of our suffering. This life may be a long, hard winter, but Christ is coming. We will see him, and all of this will melt away. Jesus said to his disciples, just as it is in childbirth, so with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. You see, his disciples grieved when Jesus died. But after his resurrection, they saw him again, and they rejoice, and we rejoice along with them, for Jesus is alive, and no one can take away our joy. No one can take the resurrection away from us. And even though we have not seen him, we are filled with joy. It says in 1 Peter 1.8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I should just fill you with joy. Do you have the joy of knowing Christ? I didn't hear you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Believe in him and you will be filled with this joy. The prayer is that Jesus would come to us, that God would fill us with his joy through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our joy is permanent because Jesus lives. Our joy is secure. But I, I want us to remember this, because there's some tension in all of this. In this life, the turning uh, of grief to joy is not something that just happens once in our life and then we are all joy all the time. Just like the seasons change, there will be seasons of grief and there will be seasons of great joy. The disciples experienced this even after the, the resurrection of Jesus. 
Yeah. The Apostle Paul wrote about the trouble he faced in 2 Corinthians 1.18, and he said, We are under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Christ himself was described as a man of sorrow. In this life, we will live with the tension of grief and joy. There will be times when we hurt, even if we have the strongest of faith in Jesus. Now, I'm going to say this about grief. We need to give ourselves that time and space to heal. We, we can't just rush through it. We often want to push through it and just make it all better and get it behind us, but grieving takes time. Sometimes we will be up, and sometimes we will be down. Things may feel like they're getting a lot worse than before they ever get better. There will be tears. Uh, tears have this way of helping us wash away the pain. In this life, we will live with the tension of grief and joy, but in Christ, no one can take away our joy. You can have my grief, but no one can take our joy. My encouragement to you is this. Work at enjoying God now. Work, work at enjoying God now. I sometimes think that we forget that we can enjoy God now. You know, it's easy to start to believe that, you know, life is just hard, and I'm just going to have to bear with it uh, until I get to heaven. But we can have joy now. The disciples did. We see that in their life. We can rejoice in Christ now. We can be satisfied in Christ now. Christ is enough for us. Christ is all we need. Enjoy God. Open up your heart, those hurting hearts to him, and he will help you have joy now. Jesus promised his disciples help from above. I want you to look at verse 23. Jesus said to his disciples, in that day you will no longer ask me anything. And that being the day when they, they saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. And the reason they would no longer ask him anything is because they finally understood the riddle. They, they understood Christ's death and resurrection. Jesus then had another important truth he wanted to tell them. He said, very truly I tell you. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. See, Jesus right here is talking about prayer. And how after his resurrection, his disciples would be given this new privilege. Because of Christ, they would be able to speak to God the Father directly in prayer. And because of Christ's atoning work on the cross, we have direct access to God. We can speak to him in prayer and we can know that he will answer us. There is power in Jesus' name. For in his name we can approach God's throne with confidence. It says in Hebrews 4.16, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus then said to his disciples, Until... Now you've not asked for anything in my name. Up to that point, they, they had asked Jesus many things, but they had not asked God the Father for things in Jesus' name. This is a new privilege brought about by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And I want you to look at what Jesus said to them. This is a great word to us. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Do you see that connection between joy and prayer? You know, I sometimes don't think we, we, we take advantage of this privilege enough. Sometimes I think we don't have because we don't actually ask God. We starve ourselves of joy because we remain silent. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. And the word complete means to be filled to capacity. Your, your cup is, so, is full to the brim. I wouldn't be surprised if God filled their cup actually till it would overflow a little bit. Right? To overflowing. There's no shortage of joy in Christ. Now I want us to cautious, caution us in this before we get carried away. I, I know how you are. 
okay, before we get all carried away. I, I caution us to think through how our joy should be filled. You know, if we approach the Lord with wrong motives, I'll tell you, you're going to be disappointed. Some may think that, like, winning the lottery will make their joy complete. Others might think, owning a home these days would make my joy complete. Some may think, you know, if their husband had an attitude change, that would make their joy complete. Not in my wife's situation, but... Uh, some may think that if they had greater abilities, their joy would be complete. But our joy is only filled in Christ. We see, one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. True joy does not come from things, but it comes from God. Rely on God and his wisdom and the pow his power that is work at work in you, and he will fill your cup up with joy. We are told in Ephesians 3.19 that God... You have to hear this. This is going to blow you away. God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Meaning that we can't think big enough when it comes to God filling our cups up with joy. Ask him and you will receive. The Spirit of God will fill you with the fullness of God and you will rejoice in Christ. Let God be the one who fills up your cup. Have you ever, have you ever taken a cup, you know, it was filled with an old beverage? Turn on the tap, you let it run, and you just put that, that cup under there. And as the water runs, that old beverage just starts to come out. And if you hold it there long enough, it fills up with clean water. In prayer, hold your cup up to God. Let, let him pour into you and wash out all that hurt, wash out all that disappointment, and just fill you with the joy of knowing Christ. No one can take away our joy. Our joy is permanent because Jesus lives. Jesus was victorious over sin and death, and he shares his victory with all who believe. See, our joy is permanent because we share in Jesus' victory. Our joy is permanent because we share in Jesus' victory. Our joy is that Christ is not dead. He is alive. He is risen from the dead, and if he lives, we live. We share in his victory over sin and death, and no one can take away the victory we have in Christ. Did you know we can summarize how all of this ends? In two words, did you know that? And the two words are this, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Our joy is permanent because he shares his victory with us. I want us just to finish this morning by looking at verses 32 and 33. And the more I think about this, the more I'm amazed at how much Jesus loves us. He tells his disciples, a time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me alone. He is telling them, in my greatest hour of need, you as my disciples will abandon me. You know, have you ever felt the, the pain of a friend or, or a parent abandoning you, leaving you? When Jesus was arrested, his disciples scattered. No one stood by his side. But Jesus said, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Jesus relied fully on his Father, even in his suffering. He, he was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of, of, suffer, of suffering and familiar with pain. And what he says next is where I'm just amazed by his love. Verse 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Along with all that he had said kind of in the previous chapters leading up to this, he just finished telling them that he would die and he would be raised to life. And he said, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. And this is peace with God, a reconciled relationship. And what gets me along with this is he told them they would abandon him. Even though they would abandon him, they could still have peace. 
They had nothing to do with Jesus' victory over sin and death. And yet he was willing to share it with them. He shares it with all who believe in him. See, Jesus forgives us for turning our backs on him. You know, I, if you think about all the movies that are kind of being made these days, there's so many of them have this basic premise of, if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. And we watch it for two-hour chunks. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. And the message of Jesus is, I will forgive you of all the hurt. I, I will lay down, I have laid down my life for you. It's just a different storyline. Believe in me and I will give you peace. Jesus gives them these words to hold on to and he really has given us these words for us to hold on to. In this world, you will have trouble. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Take heart. Christ has overcome sin. Christ has come overcome death. You may grieve, but in Christ, our grief will turn to joy. See, in Revelation 21.4, John was given a vision of the new earth. And for all who live there, it says, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. You see, in Christ, grief, it's temporary. A day is coming where there will be no more tears, there will be no more crying or pain. For in Christ, joy is permanent. And I, I really don't know how to imagine it all. I try. But at the end of the day, I, I believe it. I might not be able to imagine it all, but I believe it. You know, I, I don't think the disciples had one ounce of joy in them when Jesus was buried. They could not rejoice. See, that their sorrow had been swallowed up, or their sorrow had swallowed up their joy. But when they saw Jesus alive, joy filled their hearts. See, our joy is that Christ is not dead. He is alive. I want you to live on this truth. Jesus died. And if you believe in him, you died in him. You were buried with him along with your sins. But as he rose in victory, you along with him rise because he shares his victory with all who believe. My prayer is that we all share this joy. But those who do not believe in Jesus cannot. And my word to you is this, do not wait another day. Believe in Jesus. When Jesus is the source of our joy, our joy cannot be taken from us. In this world, we will have trouble. But take heart. Christ has overcome the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you, God, are the one who raises the dead. It is you, with your great love, who sent your Son to die on a cross for our sin. We praise you and we thank you for the love that you have for us and the grace that you have shown us. Lord Jesus, we put our faith fully in you. We ask that you come to us, that we may be filled with the Holy Spirit and enjoy your joy and know it. God, that you would just work in our grieving hearts. You know that we hurt and ache, for you were a man of sorrow, but you are also full of joy and you share your joy with us. Help us in the wait as we wait for your return. Lord, give us the faith to hold on, that we would be strong and look to you. We thank you for this word 
that we know that, yes, we will have grief, but our grief will turn to joy. And we celebrate in the knowledge that you, our Lord and Savior, has overcome this world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite Pastor Scott and Kendall to the front. As we sing of the day that we will see Christ again. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And 
and I will rise when he calls my name no more sorrow no more pain I will rise on eagle's wings before my God fall on my knees and rise I will rise one day we're going to hear Jesus call our name and we will rise for there is a resurrection of the dead coming. And when our life is secure in Christ, our joy is permanent in Christ. And whether this is a time of grief for you or joy, we know that Christ is with us. And in Christ, grief is temporary, but joy is permanent. I just want to close us with a few announcements. This week, I, I feel that our, our congregation is in the midst of a season of grief, we've had to say goodbye to some, some people who we love and care for. I know we have hurting hearts amongst us. Uh, Marietta McEwen had to say goodbye to her brother yesterday. I ask that you just pray for her and her family. We know it's so hard to say goodbye to the ones we love. And uh, remember that we are family. If one part suffers, we all suffer together. Just lift her up a prayer. And also, I want you to lift up uh, Daphne Burrell, who's very ill right now. She's at home. Her family's gathered around her. Just pray that you'd be, pray with, be with John and, and family, and that they just be able to show her great love and just care for her. Uh, we heard along with them. We ask God to do great things in their life. And just as a reminder to sign up, we've got a Good Friday service. Uh, this Friday at 10 o'clock. It'll be live stream or in person. We also have our Easter service on, on Sunday. I'm asking people just to sign up early if you could do it this afternoon just so I have a, an understanding how many are coming because if we, if we end up getting too many coming, which I'm hoping, I'm, we're going to have to do a second service, but we'll figure that out. So please, I'm just asking you do a second or sign up for me just early and help me plan. And as you go into your week, as you go into the world, my prayer for you is this. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 